Hello and welcome to Skylanders Spyro's Adventure, the developer commentary. I've been a fan of this franchise since it launched back in 2011, and I wanted to learn more about development of the game, but not just the game, the industry as a whole. In each video, I'll be interviewing a different person involved in making this game what it is, and learning about each corner of the industry in the process. The version of the game I'll be playing is the Wii version, as that was the system it was originally made for, and I will also be playing the extra purchasable levels, and we'll find out a little bit more about them in a later video. If you like this series, subscribe, leave a like, share the video around, and also click that notification bell to be notified when the next video comes out. Thank you very much. But for now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my first guest, the head of Toys for Bob at the time of development, Paul Ritchie. First off, thank you for agreeing to uh, be interviewed because, yeah, it's, it's a massive honour. <laughs> I guess we'll start off with uh, what were your roles during the development of Skylander Spyro's Adventure? Oh, well, my roles um, started off with coming up with the initial um, idea for the concept of toys coming to life. Um, I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again, which is that I got as a studio head for Toys for Bob, you know, we've been going for, gosh, I don't know, almost 20 years at that point. And part of my job as a studio head was interacting with the corporate headquarters, which in this case was Activision down in Santa Monica. And so I get a lot of email that, that sometimes is humorously written. And the, one of the ones I got was from Activision's legal department that said something to the effect of, we've determined that patents are valuable things. Therefore, if you have any patents, uh, patentable ideas, would you please patent them? And then we will have those patents. And it was not a particularly inspiring, like, um, you know, let's go, guys. Let's do this thing. And I thought it was actually so funny that I said, OK, I don't think anybody else is going to respond to this, but I am. So I wrote down three ideas. And um, uh, one of them was for Toys to Life. Uh, and the other was for a, a GPS land grab game, effectively, kind of ter territory capture. And both of those patents were submitted. Um, the Toys to Life patents have all come to fruition. Um, and so then that sort of went into the Activision legal department. And I was, you know, working with the studio to finish another game. And then we were working. Um, so Vivendi purchased Activision. And that offered the opportunity to work with Spyro. And so my boss at the time, Dave Stoll, great, great boss, um, he said, hey, Paul, Toys for Bob should really do a game for the Wii because I think it's the right audience for your kind of game. And also, I think Spyro would be a great license for you guys to use. Are you interested in that? So I thought about that and I talked with, you know, Fred and a couple of the other people, Fred Ford, my founding partner, and a couple of the other people in the studio. And everyone's like, yeah, that sounds fun. So we, we started working on just crazy ideas. And I, I had totally forgotten the Toys to Life thing at this point. And I started working with designers and I started working with Iwe Hong, um, uh, a great artist and, and tinkerer and just great guy all around. And um, he drew something that looked like little toys. And that reminded me, oh my God, we submitted this patent. Um, so then I said, drop some little little monster toys and sort of let's add some like fantasy role playing elements like little magic potions and swords and monsters and stuff. So he drew up some of those. And then we had two other ideas, um, one involving a talking egg <laughs> called the companion egg, uh, which I still think was a really bad idea, but funny. And the other was even worse. It was um, motion sensing hats. And the gameplay all involved sensing body motion and interacting with other people, like kind of rebounding off of them. So it was sort of like, at best, um, kind of like Spyro Mosh Pit or something like that. So we had these, and then we had one other idea for a, a gritty reboot for Spyro, in which um, Spyro and all of the other denizens of his world wake up on Earth and they're teeny tiny, like the size of toys, and there are no humans. The human, and so they don't know what happened to the humans, but so it's the sort of bizarre post-apocalypse where, where Spyro and all of his friends and all of his enemies are learning how to interact with this empty world of ours. And, um, and that was really weird, is all I'll say. So we did some work on that. But ultimately, what my boss, uh, Dave Stoll, you know, he was asking, well, what do you want to do? And I said, okay, I'll tell you, but first, you give me your thoughts. 
and he said, oh, I think this toy idea is the obvious winner. He said, I just think it's crazy, um, you know, and like to make this work, it'll have to be the most successful kids game of all time. But, you know, it's, it's a huge creative swing. Um, and I said, oh, well, that was exactly the right idea. And um, he pr I probably would have said that if he, you know, thought the hats was awesome. But, uh, but we decided then, you know, and, and I think we went to the studio or I went to the studio and said, hey, guys, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to make toys. We're going to make them interactive. And it was this great combination of huge excitement and huge fear because, of course, we've never really made toys. So um, Iwe and I started working on toy designs and the rest of the studio started working on prototypes for movement and combat. And then Robert Leyland started working on the technology to detect RFIDs and then to communicate that information to the Wii so that the Wii could react to changes in um, you know, the toys being placed on the portal. And um, so that was, that whole process took about, I would say three or four months from the time Dave Stoll told me, go, uh, till we how we're ready to show something to Activision. And, you know, we put a toy on the portal and the character came to life in the world and just you could feel it at that point that, oh my God, I've never felt anything like this and it's awesome. And I feel really powerful and this is a cool little toy. Um, and then I had to do some, like, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but like guerrilla marketing within Activision where I went to all of the other <laughs> studio heads and basically gave them handmade toys. And um, some of the executives got them and then some of the executives' kids got their hands on them and fell in love with them. So we sort of did this um, kind of outreach program, Hearts and Minds. And, um, and then, you know, we got really good response from Activision and then it was just a matter of sort of fulfilling what the gameplay side was going to be like. And then um, that gave us the green light for the full game, which took another two years, basically. I, uh, I spoke to Iwe and he mentioned the hats. I, was, I think it's a great idea. Like, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be up for that. It'd be awesome. I want to wear a fez. It's wide open. I'm telling you. It's one of those quick hop on that patent. That was not the third patent. But the idea of... Um, I have wanted to do this... Uh, so I'm like a lame nerd and dancing for me is one of the most painful things in the world but under the right circumstances um, usually if I'm actually dancing with a little kid I all of my inhibitions go away and I can have a lot of fun and I was thinking god it would be so great to do this with other people in a game environment where it was just laughing and jumping around and heavy breathing <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> nothing judgmental nothing um, where you felt like you had to perform and there are the cool people and the not cool people and, and that you can sort of bonk into each other too. So I, there probably would have been the need for helmets eventually, but I still think yeah. there's something to be said for a game that gets people physically interacting in a fun and not judgmental way. Yeah, yeah of course. Did your roles change from Skylander game to Skylander game? Because obviously the first game was very much sort of promoting the idea, I guess. Yeah, they did change. And I think in part it was because the studio grew and um, the, the thing, so initially I was much more involved in game design and narrative and kind of all aspects of the game. Fred handles all of the technical leadership and anything that requires serious thought and brain power, that's, that's Fred. And I tended to be more on the creative side. And in all past games, I pretty much run the creative direction in all features of the game. But um, sort of starting in the second Spyro game in Giants, I just couldn't do that anymore. They'd gotten too big, and Giants was a really fast production. So, um, and also, frankly, the, ta the people we had in, in design were um, c totally capable of doing it with, without that much input from me. So I ended up uh, focusing with Iwe primarily on character design and hardware innovation. So Iwe and I would work together, and sometimes Iwe would just bring a rough sketch and we would start there, and then sometimes I would tell him an idea for a character and then he would start sketching it. And then Iwe is just so awesome to work with because he sketches at the level of detail that's necessary at the time. And I've worked with people who either could not do finished sketches, so you could never show anybody else a real life piece of art or spent so long making finished art that it, the process wasn't sort of wild and fun and interactive. 
And Ewey knows how to do that. So he and I would go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then we would eventually have a character and we would turn that over to the modeling team. In fact, earlier on, he would just then do the, the clay sculpture of it and paint it. And I had made um, plastic toys and rubber monsters as a hobbyist for fun. Um, so I knew the basics of making molds and casting and I taught that to Ewey and some other people. And that's when we created this little production line on our office counter <laughs> where we were just basically crafting toy after toy after toy. And then we had a little, you know, the artists. And these are artists who are like animators or environment 3D artists, but they all had traditional art training. So they were able to paint toys and it was really fun. Um, that, was a, that was a great couple of months there where we were a little toy company. It would be interesting to know the journey of how you got to where you are now. How did your career begin? <laughs> um, well, uh, there's a lot of starting points. Um, but in high school, in the 10th grade, when I was 15, I went into an advanced chemistry class where I was just barely competent to sit in the room. And I noticed this guy sitting next to me, and he had these three little pamphlets that had monsters and and you know fantasy stuff on it and there were no fantasy games i i played traditional games board games card games but um i just couldn't figure out what i was looking at so i asked him and he said oh this is dungeons and dragons and he explained it to me and i said oh i'd really like to try it and he said well we have a, you know we play every day at, in my basement so i went over there and i met a couple of other guys one of whose name was errol otis and another guy named Matt Genzer. And we played D&D &D together uh, pretty fanatically for a couple of years. And Errol is an amazing artist. Even at 15 and 16, he was an amazing artist. And if you just Google E-R-O-L-O-T-U-S, you'll see his art because he became one of the official Dungeons and Dragons artists. Oh, wow. But anyway, so we, start, we ended up starting a company. We decided, heck, we can do this. We know how to make rules and draw characters and, and lean on Errol's art skills. And um, so we started making our own D&D &D books. And, uh, and, you know, they were sort of generic fantasy role playing. And they had a very different tone. They were very funny. Um, they were uh, not jokes, but they were really out there. So they took, you know, traditional uh, mythology was pretty much being mined very rapidly by everybody else. So we, we kind of went crazy and we created two books one called the uh, Necromicon, uh, and <laughs> with an A instead of an O, we were very careful about that. Um, and that was a book of fantasy magic spells. So we just created our own set of magic spells that were what we thought should be there and were pretty funny and interesting. And then that we sold I don't know, a few thousand of those um, around the world. And this is when we're 16 and 17 now. We then wrote a much larger book called Booty and the Beasts, B-O-O-T-Y, and the Beasts. And that was nice. a book of monsters and treasure that you could use in your fantasy role-playing games. And these aren't computer games at this point. These are just paper games. And that, that did even better. And at the same time, actually, before getting into Dungeons & Dragons, I learned to program extremely badly but um, uh, on teletypes um, at a science center up in the Berkeley Hills. So I knew the basics of computers, um, and but I still was more fascinated with role-playing games. So I went to college, or graduated from high school, and um, went to college to go into high-energy physics because I wanted to make fusion starship drives, <laughs> and uh, rapidly learned that my math skills were not up to that. So plan B was moving out to Wisconsin and joining the Dungeons & Dragons company with Errol and working there on Dungeons and Dragons. And just before I moved out there, I was selling some books at a D&D convention, and this guy next to me said, hey, I'm really interested in role-playing games, but I make computer games. And I said, really, what are, like, teletype games? And he's like, no, no, they're on these early, you know, pet machines and early TRS-80s and the Apple II. And I was, one, I was amazed at how primitive they were compared to, like, what we were doing in paper. But I also knew enough about computers to see that this is pretty cool. So he and I ended up striking up a friendship. And I went to Wisconsin, worked on D&D, got in a big fight with the powers that be there, <laughs> came back. And meanwhile, this guy, John Freeman, J-O-N-F-R-E-E-M-A-N, um, had founded one of the first computer game companies called Automated Simulations. 
And then shortly thereafter, he and a woman named Anne Westfall and I founded something called Free Fall Games um, and did uh, two of Electronic Arts' first two games. When Electronic Arts was founded, um, one, their name was originally Arctronics, but it turned out that was taken, so they switched to Electronic Arts. But they put out seven games, and we did a game called Archon and a game called Murder on the Zendernif. Except on Murder on the Zendernif, we added this other guy, this crazy New Zealand kid named Robert Leyland. And so Robert and I met each other when we were like 21, 20, 21. And Robert, skip to the mid-2000s, is the person who kind of builds all of our prototype electronics in the Skylanders. So Robert and I had continued to work together on and off through that intervening, you know, from 1981 until, until just like last year, Robert and I had worked together on and off. So um, that was, so at that point then, I was working with a studio, making games, and I pretty much just continued to do that, creating new groups or finding new groups and then in, um, so I worked on a game called Mail Order Monsters and a golf game, believe it or not, called uh, Electronic Arts First Golf Game. And then um, I worked on a couple of games that uh, didn't, didn't see the light of day and ended up shifting over to Accolade from Electronic Arts. My producer, Shelley Day, moved from Electronic Arts to Accolade and said, I'll get you a great deal at Accolade. We'll get you a multi-game contract. Um, your future is set. And I thought, that's great. So I signed up for three games and had I was the only person in that team at that point. So I said, oh my God, I'm going to need some, some serious help to make three games here. And so that's when I was introduced to Fred Ford. Uh, we, I, I went to my friend Greg Johnson's. He's another game designer who made games like Starflight and Toe Jam and are all great game designer. Anyway, he had a game night at his house. And so we were sort of had this blind date during Fred's, or, um, Greg's game night. And Fred and I realized that we had a lot in common. We wanted to make games, same kinds of games, and also that we had actually been at university at exactly the same time in the exact same spot. Uh, it's just he'd actually gone ahead and finished university, whereas I had run off to Wisconsin to work on Dungeons & Dragons. So that's when we started working on the original Star Control game. And um, I don't know if you know anything about Star Control or Star Control 2. There was a lot of news about it in the past few years. but Very little, we, sadly. It's um yeah it's uh, we have a lot of very dedicated and wonderful fans for those games. After we did those, we started working on a game called The Horde uh, for Crystal Dynamics. So we shifted from um, Accolade to Crystal Dynamics, and from Crystal Dynamics, we were there for seven or eight years working on Pandemonium and the Unholy War. And at the very end of our time there, we started working on 101 Dalmatians, uh, and found out that we really liked making games for kids. And so it was that game that we then, uh, there was a layoff at Crystal Dynamics, <laughs> I think it was Christmas Eve or something like that, some horrible night to get a phone call that, you, by the way, you don't have a job, now please call the rest of your team and tell them that too. That's one of those funny experiences in life that is only funny years after it actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> but then it was a great opportunity because they, they laid off a whole functional team and Fred and I, had some some friends who we'd brought into the industry on Pandemonium that had started a game company called Shaba that was working with Accolade. And they said, hey, Paul and Fred, just pull together your team and we'll get you a contract with with Activision. And uh, we said, oh, huh, okay, well, that seems like a nice way to start off a studio. So that actually worked. And we started working on um, Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure, which I think is a really great game. I'm going to stand up and say I loved our... Tony Hawk based games. But um, so we did that, and then we started working on the Madagascar games and Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam. And throughout this year, I mean, it just, our studio goes from me and Fred in a small room to me and Fred and Robert in a small room to me and Fred and Robert and, and Ken Ford, Fred's brother, also a programmer. And we just add people slowly but surely until by Skylanders, we're up to like 120 or 130 people. Um, and it was very organic, but my role went from being the only artist and designer to being mostly the artist and designer. We hired a few people to help, and then, you know, by the time we're starting to work on the Madagascar games, my job as studio head 
was a lot of management, a lot of conversation with headquarters down in Santa Monica, and then some kind of creative oversight. So you just got a really complete long-winded version of how I got here. I mean, that, that's what I wanted. Like, it's the, the whole point of this series is to, you know, not just learn about the development, but also learn about, you know, the industry, what it what it's like getting into it, what it's like being in it. And like, I, I hope for like people hear these stories and 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 be like oh yeah i want to do that like that yeah I, I hope so too it's i mean you know when i got into it you could fit everyone in the industry in you know a large house probably <laughs> um and you know the first game developers conference that you know we we went to the prototype game developers conferences that ea held and then my friends started the first game developers conference and you know Fred and I talked at them and you know it was there, there was like 30 or 40 people in the audience and um, so the world was very different then and it it just wasn't part of um, it wasn't understood or cool really in the broader human existence so it still was sort of our secret that we had these great games we were making and then you know, now it is the dominant form of media, really. Um, it's just astounding to me to have witnessed that change. And I think we've, there have been fun things to do all along the way. They changed a lot, but it's still, I love coming to work every day. And, you know, Fred and I have sat three feet away from each other for over 30 years now. Um, actually, Twice for Bob is 30 years old. So, yeah, so... It's, uh, yeah, over 30 years. So, and that's a pretty amazing accomplishment in and of itself. Um, so I think one of the things that I was talking with the new heads of Toys for Bob, because Fred and I have gone into this sort of like weird uncle phase of our existence where we're not actually leading Toys for Bob anymore. We're in the office, we're working on something, but it's not as part of Toys for Bob proper. Uh, but we're around to kind of offer advice when they ever need it. And I was talking with the new studio head, Paul, and he was sort of talking about how they, he has taken the culture of Toys for Bob and, and Avery Lodato is his technical partner, and how they interpreted what we had created in the culture and were trying to kind of continue it and, and enrich it further. And he said, what I've realized is you didn't make Toys for Bob to make money or to get famous. You created Toys for Bob because you love to make games and you love to be with people who love to make games. And that's really true. And, you know, it's there's nothing like seeing uh, fans love your game, particularly kids, because they're so not judgmental or adults who act like kids. Um, it's just pure joy. But also just being around people who have the same weird commitment to entertaining others through games is... Um, Yes, that's, that's my favorite thing about coming to work. That's that's fantastic. Um, I want to go back to Skyland. There's a bunch of like little potentially quick fire questions. Uh, we'll we'll see. Um, yeah, I'm pretty. Yeah, feel free to um, give me a time frame we, if you need it. No, no. no. Um, but yeah. Uh, so there was there was a rumor of a, a game called Spyro's Kingdom was in development. Was that Skylanders Spyro's Adventure or maybe was it even the gritty Spyro reboot idea or, or was it even a thing? Like <laughs> it, That was the code name for um, Skylanders Spyro's Adventure early on. I can't remember if we used it for the gritty reboot. I don't really think that ever got a name. Although <laughs> it's sort of like a weird fever dream, that idea. <laughs> There's something there, but it just isn't charming and delightful. What would you have done in the game? Well, the premise was, uh, first it was an exploration adventure, but in it, it was set with you being about six inches tall. So it was a post-apocalyptic toy story. Right. And <laughs> as you were exploring the world, Spyro's enemies were also exploring the world, and so they were finding like ways to make knives into swords. And then it was a sort of watership down existence where <laughs> <laughs> I want to see this. The, over, the <laughs> overarching mystery was what happened to the humans, because it's never entirely clear that that, that there. I mean, at the very first moment of the very first Spyro game, he's being interviewed right by a TV. News, newscaster mm. and um so there's clearly some 
awareness of human-like behavior. But the, the mundane human world uh, is not something that I think Spyro was part of. So we were part of what we were trying to do was we were seeing that the development and the visual technology, which we were being pushed to use, really was great at doing realistic things, but that we could make nicer cartoon things, but the real dramatic change would be if we could sort of blend these cartoon characters, bring them into 3D, and then put them in the real world, and just this bizarre contrast. And part of the reason I wanted to do this was I was told at this point that kids' games could not work economically. So we were saying, okay, well, gosh, how do you make a Spyro game for teenagers or adults? Um, and so it was, well, okay, it's post-apocalyptic, and it's mysterious, and... You know, there's this overarching mystery that's kind of relevant to you and me because what happened to us? Are we in this world of Spyro? Are we dead? You know. So anyway, and I have a fascination with this box with this stuff anyway. So, but ultimately, sometimes things that are really interesting to you as an individual are not very interesting to people in a larger sense. So <laughs> that is what we ultimately discovered was that one. That's not what people want from Spyro, surprise, surprise. And two, we're just not the studio to make gritty anything. I mean, mm -hmm. at least it wasn't when Fred and I were leading the studio. Um, we're about joy and beauty and laughing um, and, you know, intense experiences, but not something that ever makes you feel bad. Yeah, and what you create is is wonderful and, and certainly has brought joy to, to myself. Um. So I mean, I mean, I've oh, seen, so I've bad. seen, like, I've seen firsthand from obviously me, but also like I've, uh, my cousins. Uh, I have a, I have a, a cousin who's uh, seven now, and when he first came to my place, he just saw like this wall of Skylanders. He was like, oh, oh my god! <laughs> he freaked out. It was amazing. I loved. It. I was, I was in Tapa, Mexico, this tiny little airport in the coast, west coast of southern Mexico, about three weeks ago, and. I was exhausted after a vacation and I was traveling with an eight year old boy and there was this other family, Israeli family, that had boys about the same age and they were sort of, you know, uh, kids in an airport that were going to play with each other. And then one of the kids looks up and he sees my shirt and he's like, Skylanders? Why, why do you have a Skylanders shirt on? And I go, oh, you know, I worked on the game and, and, uh, and the dad looks over to me real serious and he says, you worked on Skylanders? And I said, yeah. And he said, what did you do? And I told him, and he goes, you owe me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, I can't, believe, I can't believe that you would have a game where when the toy's defeated, you can never use it again. And I kind of looked at his kid, and I looked at him, and I realized there was something going on here. So I said, you know, that is not exactly the case. You know, the toy can't be used for a few minutes or until you restart the level, but it works. And his son, I think, had told him a bit of a fib wow. <laughs> in order to get more toys. I see. Wow. Uh, to, to quickly... So even in southern Mexico, you can run into Skylanders fans. They're on the trail, and we, we've had stories from, like, above the North Pole to all over the world. Did you expect Skylanders to get as big as it did? No, I, I never expected anything in my life to get that big, and I don't know how you do. Um, we thought it was really cool, uh, but, you know, we'd never made toys. Activision had never sold toys, really. Uh, they'd sold lots of stuff for uh, Guitar Hero, but this was different. And, you know, for the first couple of weeks, it took a couple of weeks to catch on. And so for that first couple of weeks, we were, like, going to the stores and seeing the stuff on the shelves and seeing people sort of try it out. Um, and then one week it just took off worldwide and whether it was in Germany or Sweden or you know US or Australia it just I don't know what happened but like the the you know kind of collective unconsciousness of children everywhere latched onto it and then the next thing we were told was you fools you didn't make enough toys and you know but they didn't actually say that but they're like we got to make more toys and unlike discs that you can just print really quickly toys you have to manufacture and then ship on boats and stuff so there was you know a month or two where there was no toys in the store and everyone thought that was clever clever marketing but it was totally accidental because no one could have guessed how well it was going to do and then with giants you know we just 
um, you know, we're like, oh, what, what, what can we do? Let's make great big toys. Let's make toys that glow. Let's, I mean, it was so fun to explore all of that. And Robert was working on, you know, toys with um, uh, or super capacitors, and I was working on lasers, which it turns out there's no safe amount of laser light for children's eyes. Um, learned that in advance of any injury, by the way. But um, we had all kinds of crazy stuff going, and it was just so fun to work on. Well, once Skylanders began to take shape, was it always called Skylanders, or did you have another name before that? Um, it was Spyro's Kingdom for a long time. Then, for a very short period of time, people were recommending Monster Squad, which thankfully was already taken. Um, and someone down at Activision, I, I think we knew it was Skylands. We had, we had already decided it was Skylands, because in one of the very earliest descriptions I wrote, I said, you know, the world is an infinite vista of clouds and sky with floating islands. You can travel any direction as far as you want and just find new adventures. And so so we knew it was Skylands. And then one of the, I think, assistant producers just said, what about Skylanders? And we all sort of went, huh, that's interesting. And, you know, started searching around to see if anyone was using it for anything and if the URL was available. And, and then, you know, we proposed all kinds of other ideas, but that was the one that we kept coming back to. And so... For a long time, it was just Skylanders, and then we were like, oh, wait a minute, we forgot. You know, Spyro's this hero. we got to make sure he's in the title. So that's how he, we ended up wanting to reinforce his presence. So that's Spyro's adventure ended up being tagged on. I see. Uh, so the game was released on October 13th, 2011, although it's, that was in Australia. There was, I think, the 14th in Europe and then the 16th in America, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, when did development actually begin? Two and a half years before that, basically. I, I don't know the precise day. I, I could find it for you if you really want to know, because I, I, <laughs> my dad was in the hospital and I was um, sitting in the parking lot uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, talking on the phone to my boss, Dave Stoll, when he said, you guys are, you know, do you want to work on Spyro? And I said, yeah. Um, it took about three or four months for us to settle. I think that, that it was the toys to life route that we wanted to go. And it was probably three months after that before we had our prototype. So, and then I think when we had the prototype, when we had the game running with toy switching, it was two years from that point until we finished. So you can kind of back up and, you know, uh, let's see what is probably, you know, sometime in like, yeah, that would make, make sense. Probably early in the year. Um, so probably like February or March uh, of 2000 and, Eight, two thousand and nine. Gosh, Fred, what year did we start Skylanders? Uh, I think it would have been in late two thousand and eight. Okay, late two thousand and eight. See, I told you, Fred does all the, the hard thing. <laughs> so, how how does it work? Do, with uh, this, they came to you and said, "Do you want to work on Spyro?" But do, in some cases, like with the uh, the patents, do you pitch something to Activision, or does it does it vary from game to game? It varies from game to game. Um, you know, there's there are many studios within Activision. Um, the population has changed over time, and what we focus on changes over time. But there's sort of opportunities which are known. Like, hey, we want to do this Disney game. We got a, a contract with Disney to use three of their licenses, and we want to make a skating board game for kids. <clears throat> so that was handed to us by Activision, and then we fulfilled it. And another time, it was... With, with Skylanders was, hey guys, we don't have any idea what to make. You know, the, the market for the movie tie-in games had dramatically dropped. And that had been kind of our, our what we had been doing for a while. So we sort of needed to find a new reason to exist. And in that case, it was, the skies was the limit. You know, Spyro was, was a part of it. Um, but that was a very wide open, um, what do you guys want to do? And so it really depends on what's going on. You know, for some studios, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we have this other game that needs, you know, needs some help to be awesome. So can, you know, you d devote some of your people to working on it. Toys for Bob has had a limited amount of that because our focus is so much on kids. So, you know, studios like Phoenix and Vicarious Visions were sort of the, the younger, 
more colorful, sweet game studios. But even VV and Vinox now are helping Call of Duty, and there's a you know as the number of lice, uh, franchises has shrunk within Activision, there's been more and more studio collaboration uh, around a smaller number of titles. Was there ever a consideration for Skylanders to be a different genre? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think we talked a lot about. Well, I guess it was sort of the the, the proportion of of genre ingredients because I Fred and I like to make genre blending games, uh, and so we knew it was sort of a, a fantasy role playing slash action platformer, and the amount of puzzle solving and the amount of traditional role playing versus the kind of just free motion was a uh, big choice. So Sonic the Hedgehog has always been one of my kind of acmes, one of my models for the joy of movement. It was very intentionally designed to not make you afraid to go fast. Whereas in most games, if you go fast, you die or you, you don't succeed because you know there's a problem and the problem needs to be observed and, and dealt with carefully. But in Sonic, you know, you almost always had at least one ring and, you know, and you could almost always catch rings when they get knocked out of you. So just the joy of movement was, was important. And that's something that we've tried to have a fair amount of that. And then, however, as we started looking at the way combat works, combat was built around um, essentially three archetypes, uh, which was um, contact, uh, characters like chompies, um, you know, lobbers that would sit back from a distance and then indirect fire people who could hit you uh, with, with something and sort of cheat. Uh, and then barriers that either you could hide behind or gaps that you had to get over. Those are sort of the game design components that we were working with in for, for as far as most enemies. And when we once we got to that, that we realized that we couldn't rocket through the terrain because that did require you to to observe what was happening. And part of that just sort of we, we, we kept backing up and saying, well, we want to have all these characters. You know, someday we may have 50 characters. <laughs> and so that's a lot of different powers. So you have to have stuff to act on with those powers. You can't just jump on their heads and have that be the solution to everything. So so that meant okay, there has to be complex and interesting things that the enemies do to you, which means you have to have time to perceive them. So that sort of slowed the game down. So it wasn't a fast, fast moving platformer. And also we were just discovering how expensive and hard it was to build cool looking worlds. And if you could just rocket through it in you know, three minutes, that was no fun. So that's sort of what made the game's pacing what it ended up being. And we debated a lot about the platforming components. And you can see the transition between Giants and Swap Force where Jump was added. And yeah. then we were fighting that because what we thought was that the younger audience would get stuck on the jumping puzzles and that the game would be about... So in a nutshell, Skylanders for me was about making you feel awesome as this character, this interesting and unique character. So we wanted the enemies to provide you with this really rewarding opportunity to defeat them. You know, they really weren't there to to kill you. I mean, they did if you weren't careful, but some games it's out to kill you, like, you know, Dark Souls for example. That's that's what it's all about and that's what makes it awesome. That isn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to provide you with this rich challenge but we wanted it to feel so rewarding to defeat them, to make you feel good inside about doing it, and, and in a way that was particular to the character you had. So, but platforming is a little more just punishing. Like if you have a jump, and if it's a jump, it's gonna be pretty easy to fail. Um, and so we put in jump pads in the first two games so that we could offer jumps where we wanted them, but not let you jump all the time and not require putting in jumping puzzles. And so there was a big transition that that was something we didn't want intentionally in the first two games. It was added in the third and then in the following games we ended up sort of rolling with it how, as best we could. But that, that to this day remains I think one of the biggest decisions and uh, you know 
it was a really hard one because everybody wanted it and no one I think would give it up but it had some pretty serious impacts on who could play the game and the level of frustration that people encounter in the game I guess to a point but I mean like the 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 greatest platformers um like like Crash and Spyro and Sonic I played at like three and four and I mean every so often I'd die because I was bad at the game because I'm young, but you know, like I'm just like I don't, I don't think that kind of thing ever impacted my uh, my enjoyment of the okay. game. That's good to hear. Um, so I feel like that's never really necessarily a worry. I feel like I I like that there isn't jumping in the the first couple of games, but I feel like it was just oh, it was a natural evolution kind of. The yeah, I mean, everybody was asking for it, mm. so it was it was virtually impossible to resist, mm. um, and uh, yeah. And then later, I mean, it's easy for me to forget how much we ended up using the jump state uh, for some of the powers. So towards the end, more and more, you're getting characters who have slightly different attacks if you jump attack versus ground attack. Um, and I think the thing that I would love to have, so something that we did in the first two games that I would love to have continued, but it just proved to be very difficult, was um, like going into the water and being in the water as a water character versus, you know, and, and it would be so cool to have free flight. But um, free flight, you know, just lets you skip over everything. Yeah. So, it's... so did you originally have more than the eight elements, or did you have any different ones at any point? No, um, we originally only had eight, um, and it was debated whether that was even too much. But, you know, I, I thought it was, and I think we collectively decided it was right. And then I started wanting to do light and dark almost immediately. Right. But, I, yeah, I think uh, people genuinely believe that we we needed to kind of explore what we had before just throwing more in there, um, and also just as we supported all of our backwards toys, you needed you know our backwards compatibility with all our toys. You needed to be careful what you added in categorically because that could create this huge amount of work to support it in future games. So once you add in light and dark toys. Then in future releases, you should have light and dark toys, and that meant light and dark, you know, um, environments, uh, you know, uh, elemental areas, and so adding those two things added a lot of work mm. that we had to do, and so it was probably smart to wait as long as we did. Um, if you could add a, a new pair of elements, what would you add? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, get back to me on that. I'm curious, just like what is in your heart? You know, when we talk to people about it, there's some people who think about them in terms of like, I want the bubblegum element because I yeah. love bubblegum. And then there's other people. What who, can you really do with that? Like, like right. in a gameplay. <laughs> oh, I can't move as fast. No. Bubbles. And then there's other people who think in these dualities like good and evil or happy and sad or up or down. And, um, you know, after Light and Dark, I, I couldn't think of any that were more interesting than the ones we had. So I didn't feel like there was any shouting out, hey, come do this. We certainly could have come up with some, but I just didn't feel like there was any holes missing. Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good point. Um, yeah, I, uh, I cannot think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Desperately trying to rack my brick. The glass element. Oh, uh, you're weaker. It's hard difficulty. Right. Oh, a magnifying glass burns you, and you can see everything. Yeah. Unless there's water. Excellent. Yeah. Um, um, brilliant. Uh, nuclear fission element. <laughs> oh, the math. Oh, the math. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like void. You could always throw in void. Yeah, space, and I guess. Of, yeah. But Skylands is about, you know, like I, I literally love the idea in some of the old Flash Gordons that to go to another world, you just, you know, hop on anything that can float and you can float over to it because there's air between here and there. And um, that concept of don't, you know, infinite adventure, infinite horizons and things to explore. That to me was just so inspiring 
I never, and, and I really fought anything that had a, gave a sense that there was a limit to Skylands or that something that could simultaneously destroy the whole world of Skylands. That has come up a number of times, but I just, you know, the core of light was about as far as I wanted to go uh, in terms of something that had a very, very, very broad impact. Because I sort of wanted the idea that there's there's more stuff happening, you know, a thousand miles or a million miles away. Um, could be anything. And just that this is this infinite world of adventure. Uh, I really like that idea. Mm. So I don't know if you're allowed to say, but what kind of budget does a game like this have? You know, that that's one I'm not allowed to talk about. That is fair. Um, but um, you can, it's almost all people. Um, and, you know, the average probably monthly cost is between ten and $15,000 when you add in all the overhead and stuff like that. So you can just kind of do the math from that and it gets pretty wild. Right. Yeah, that that's fair. So how challenging is it to coordinate multiple companies working on a game like this? Because there's div different companies working on sound and animations and whatnot, right? Yeah, it depends on, you know, things like sound. It's really relatively easy to work with outside people because you can describe fairly easily what a task is and it's sort of a drop in, drop this thing in and listen to it. And um, so there's sort of hierarchies. Um, working with other people who are doing design uh, and, you know, design can be, is a very flexible term, but, you know, if someone is building a level and they're thinking of the enemies and the mechanics and the navigation mesh and the theme and the art style, there's like a lot to talk about. Um, if they're just painting textures and they have like, here's the Bible of textures, you know, here's this book that has how we make textures and here's all the examples of how we do stone or wood or, or different materials. Then you can kind of review it. You can review their mesh and see if it's matching the way you make mesh. But um, one of the hardest things is when they start making new systems um, because systems have a very broad impact across a lot of games. And because Skylanders had backwards compatibility, anything that was put in there, we had to sort of keep in there. So um, the hardest thing was working with people who were adding broad new systems and that really only happened when we were ping-ponging games back and forth between studios when it was working on <clears throat> components like you know character models sounds visual effects that's all pretty easy but when it's working on concepts i guess that's the thing you really have to have everybody bought into this is what we're trying to achieve this is what we're trying you know here's the three big jobs we have here you know like make sure that Everybody smiles when they play this. Make sure that they want to buy more toys. Make sure that the world of Spyro, that value is added to the world of Skylands. That we're not just pulling things out. Um, that we're always adding new things of value that future games can rely on. And so you really have to have someone who's stated those pillars uh, and then someone who's got the authority to maintain them. And, you know, so if someone decides, hey, we're going to put in this, like, crafting injectable drugs, you know, you can wait, 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 you know, that, that, is, that is not okay. You can't even craft alcoholic beverages, you know, maybe you can craft candy or, or like, potions or something like that. But, so there's, there's needs to be someone who is the, kind of the, who watches out for the IP for the world of, of Skylands and knows the voices of the characters and makes sure that no Spyro wouldn't say that. That's, that's not who he is. Um, and, you know, anyway, there's, I would say that in the, the hardest thing is when you're working with people doing conceptual design outside your immediate creative circle. Right. But more and more, like, concept, concept art, I mean, I, I don't know if you looked much at the a Spyro um, re remastering um, mm, yeah. reignited, but you know so much of that amazing concept work that Paul and Avery and all of the guys did was from outside concept people from all over the world, and mm. you know, these are people who 
are working at home for the most part, and our or Toys for Bob's art director is communicating with them electronically, you know, several times over the day, trading versions. And so he's doing exactly the job he does, except he's doing it with people all around the world remotely. So that sort of distributed development in some areas works really well. So what, what are the biggest challenges in creating a game like this? Ah, <sighs> um, <laughs> a lot of them then. <laughs> I, yeah. Sometimes it's simply the balance between, and, and there's the creative and then there's the practical. And I'll talk about the practical first because as a studio head, you always have to think about keeping your, um, your, your folks employed. But um, is the game you're thinking about making going to earn enough to be worth the investment? So if you pitch an idea that can be made for a million dollars, that's an, and, and it's going to make 10 million, that's an easy one. It almost doesn't matter what it is. If you can, I mean, if it's really reliable, like, and there's ways that ideas are more or less reliable. Um, if, on the other hand, you're making something, ne this game has never been made before. We have no idea about a track record of sales. Um, we don't totally understand what you're saying. It's interesting, but, you know, so there, it's very hard. That's very slow progress. You're going to have to prove it at every step. Um, they're not going to just give you a green light and say, you've got 18 months, go. Um, so that's a sort of logistical one. And, and also finding talented people <clears throat> around here anyway in the San Francisco Bay Area is really, really hard. There is not enough talent um, that wants to work on games. To, to Well, from the individual's aspect, it's great because, you know, in terms of supply and demand, the demand is much higher than the supply. But, um, you know, we, we're competing with Facebook and Pixar and, you know, all of the big dot-coms, Apple. And so for us, we need to find people who, who sort of make a lifestyle choice that this is the kind of game that they want to make. Um, you know, the place that, that our studios are located is beautiful and very family-oriented. And it's, you know, we, we focus on the culture and the... Of, you know, a work-life balance that makes sense, games that you're proud of making that you can show your kids. So you end up having to work hard to find those talented people. But then, then in terms of just producing the game, the hardest thing I think is to keep people focused and um, being creative, but being creative together in a way that supports each other. That's, that's how you get the best results, I would say. And then there's one last thing, which is the changing world. So, like, you know, you can be making a game, and then all of a sudden PUBG or Fortnite comes out, and everybody is just like, oh, my God, that, that's, that's the world. That's the, that's the way to go. And oftentimes they're right. That's, you know, I mean, there's a, you know, certainly PUBG and, and Fortnite, you know, anyway. So, so kind of knowing when to chase the latest trend and when not to is one of the hardest things because there's reasons to do both yeah that makes sense so with that in mind well, which game would you say is the hardest to develop uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna bring fred in on this fred can you hear me yeah so which game was hardest to develop the our games yeah the games that we never finished <laughs> <laughs> we've had several games we didn't finish well they as time marches on, they all require more work to finish. But in terms of, I mean, Skylanders was was so many moving parts in not just the electronic sphere, but also the, uh, making toys and um, the whole marketing uh, gimmicks they did and all of that stuff, and it. Uh, it all had to come together to make it successful. I mean, I would say that was probably the most di difficult, but but not necessarily if, because it wasn't straightforward, but just because it was so much new. An, an example of that. So, so the first games that Fred and I made back, you know, separately, we've both been in the industry, the game industry, since like 1981, the, the computer game industry. You would program your game and you would cut, duplicate disks, and you would put it in a box or in a floppy bag or something like that. And so you needed 
you needed someone to like write your manual, paint the picture for your box, and then you hired a company to put everything together and you were done and you sold it for $40. So in 1981, we're selling our games for $40. Um, and who do you coordinate with? Well, you, you need to coordinate what you need the artist to make the cover before you're done and you need the boxes ready and you need to have disc duplication ready to go. But that's like three groups maybe. And if you're going to do some marketing, you have, you know, like three magazines. So you only need one marketing person who knows those three magazines. So maybe you're coordinating, think about like lasers that all need to hit that same point at the same time to cause fusion. I don't know if this makes any sense, but there's a laser fusion system uh, that was called Shiva back in the, in the 80s. And it would shoot this tiny little deuterium pellet across this sphere that was on eight feet in diameter and hit it with like a hundred lasers simultaneously. And it, they all had to hit just at the right space at the right time to increase the temperature enough to cause fusion and then have equal pressure around that hot plasma so that the plasma just wouldn't squirt out the side. Really big problem there. But so if you think about something like Skylanders or any of the modern games, you've got online advertising and marketing, you've got influencers, you've got social media, television, toys, safety. Safety was a big deal and regulations. Um, I mean, you've got literally hundreds of people or lasers all trying to hit that same day, that first, and, and to support people. And then if you add in the way games now are being made, which is that you make kind of a smaller game initially, but then you plan on continuing that game for years. Um, so you not only need the like launch day plan, the packaged good product is what we call it, but but you also then have to have people who even before the game is done, have started building all the assets and the new cool things that's going to keep that game evolving and to keep the fans engaged for years. So it's just a vastly more complicated thing. And still, for and still the games are like not that much more expensive uh, mm -hmm. in, build, in, in dollar numbers, but you know the value of the dollar has gone uh, third in, since 1980 <coughs> or something like that. So the economics are different. The advantage is we had an audience of like 200,000 people when I was first making games and now it's 9 billion or however many billion people have cell phones. But um, understanding how the market is changing and what you need to do and how you need to coordinate, find the talent and coordinate all that talent to make something amazing happen. I mean, uh, what's astounding is, and I'm not, I'm not shilling for Call of Duty, but that's an example of one of the most complicated human endeavors every year. You know, thousands of developers, thousands of people all around the world trying to make that game the greatest it can be and, and sell as much of it as they can on the same, roughly the same week every year. And, you know, we're not in that world, but we see it from the outside and it's just, oh my God, how do they do that? Because <laughs> they're pulling off so much at the same time. Anyway. Mm. Because Skylanders has to ship with toys, does it have to go gold earlier than other games? And I guess for people who don't know, going gold is the term when the game is finished, it's put on disc, right? Um, the software was a little bit earlier, um, but the funny thing, that, but the answer to your question is yes, we had to be done earlier. The reasons had somewhat to do with software, but primarily what they had to do with was the toys had to all be done and the designs had to be completed. So, and then sent over to China, and then there's a whole like physical, unavoidable, you know, getting the molds created, which is an amazing process, and then testing the molds, and then optimizing them, and building the, the you know, uh, assembly lines, and pulling in thousands of people into the factories to do the manufacturing. So. It's, it's months and months and months. And the way it works in the real world of toys is a year before the toys are delivered, people have committed to buying them. And we, and so you have like the toys to show Toys R Us or whomever else a year before the toy is going to come out so that they know, oh, this is awesome. And now you can go off and manufacture it and it'll all be sane and at a reasonable pace. We were working right up until the last second. You know, we literally had people in China working with them on exact paint strokes 
that we wanted to have to to you know either optimize you know make it one paint stroke less or one paint stroke more so we were and we were selling our toys months before they were going to be in the stores instead of a year or two so the um and then it takes six weeks to get the toys back you know just you know they they go on a slow boat and then they go on slow trucks so the, the physicality and the just the mass of this stuff introduced a big advanced thinking and far more complicated thinking. I mean, I don't know if UA ever went over with you what it takes to paint one toy. No, but, not specifically. Oh, it's like this great puzzle. I mean, there's there's a there's an idea in there. I mean, if it's but, manually painted, it must be. It's so intricate. Every toy is so so compact, and there's so many different colors, and it's like it must take yeah. ages. And and so you de- you know you design this toy in 3D or in a drawing where there's no physicality at all, and then you build a 3D model or a sculpture, and now it's got a 3D form. But oh hey, it's got to fit inside the package. So do we know the package dimensions? Yes. Okay, good. So you make your toy fit in there. Oh, but it can't be any too sharp, and it can't be like have a thin arm holding a heavy sword, or that it'll droop. And um, so then you can't. You have engineers who take the toy and they sort of cut it into parts so that the toy can be cast in these individual parts. Now you can choose different color plastic base for each of the parts. So in some cases, you could have like a gold arm with silver detail around it, and on the other side, it's literally a cast silver arm with gold detail because you could use less paint operations to do that. So you start off with this just like painting. And like, oh, okay, we're going to have the smooth color gradation going down his back, you know, this rainbow cape. And then it comes back and you've got 28 paint ops just for the cape. And your budget is like 30 paint ops and, and you know, the eyes are going to take two or three. So it's just like, oh boy, how do we do this? And okay, what if we cast the arm in this color? And okay, we'll get rid of this detail, because, but we'll, we'll um, cast it as a separate part so that we can use a different plastic. And so it's this ever-evolving optimization so that you can get the most detailed toy that's the coolest uh, with the budget that you're given. Um, so, and pennies, man, you never knew how important pennies were. Like, if you can save a penny in it, if you work for a day and you save a penny on a toy, that was a really good day. <laughs> <laughs> how soon after the release of one game did development on the sequel begin? We were working on Giants before the release of Skylanders. Right. Um, uh, so, with the other ones, uh, Giants was a real push, because um, we did that in a single year. With the other ones, we started having two years, and so we would get the concept settled with Activision, and, the, and we'd start working on the technology um, innovation before the game was done, because you know, Eway and Robert and I wouldn't be necessary for the finishing the game software. So we would move on to pitching ideas and getting Activision to greenlight one of the ideas and then prototyping the electronics. So like um, Trap Team was this amazingly difficult prototyping phase because we knew we wanted to reverse the magic and suck characters from the world of Skylands into our physical world toys, our world toys. But we didn't know how to do that. And so we were experimenting with projectors and holograms and all of these things, which were crazy impossible to do. Um, and then we were just tearing our hair out. Uh, and oh, it was the sound department that figured it out. They did a prototype and we were all just like, oh my God, that's so brilliant. How did you guys come up with a sound solution? Sound guys. Um, so, but that took three or four months, I would say. So that was that was a scary one. Was there a lot of nervousness when it came to launch of the first Skylanders? Yeah, all of us were nervous. I mean, we loved it, and we had poured our hearts into it, and it was super risky, and it seemed super magical, but we just didn't know. Um, and up until the toys were in the stores, I just kept imagining, this can this really work? <laughs> can the things that we made in our office really show up in tens of millions of them all over the world and get sold? Like, are we just... Gonna, is this the end of our careers? If this, <laughs> you know, we were doing calculations like, okay, if this doesn't work and they ship all the toys to our office, how full is our giant office? <laughs> oh man, 
it's like overflowing, 10 feet high, filling the office. We'll just be swimming like Uncle Scrooge and his money bin, uh, just swimming through empty Skylanders. But uh, so, yeah, I would say up until week two or three of sales, we were all um, positive but nervous or, or like giddy with anticipation. Yeah. Were there any limitations because you were creating a Wii game first and foremost? Yeah, there were some. I mean, just sort of technical visuals, yeah, and memory-wise. But um, we were we had been working on the Wii for a while, so we sort of knew how to get a lot out of it. Um, you know, we tried doing more stuff with motion control initially because you know you have the controllers, so why not use them? And those just weren't fun. We tried doing more with the portal and sort of doing like a hotter, colder gameplay experience with the portal's light and discovered that that wasn't super fun. Um, and so there was a lot of trying things that were Wii specific, but beyond that, no, it, it, it was pretty, I, we were all really comfortable with the Wii. I still think that was a great system. Yeah, I mean like the, uh, the canon gameplay I think is much better on the Wii because you've got the motion controls. I, I remember playing it on the PS3 and it certainly wasn't bad, but like it was because, uh, you know, you're just moving a uh, analog stick, you know, it's... Yeah, there's something about physical engagement. Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam, I think, had some of the best um, use of the controller. Uh, just, it had tilt and jump and, and anyway, I thought that was really great, but... Um, you know, it didn't feel anything like it if you ported it. Mm. Just because, you know, you're moving your body. I guess it's sort of like the hats thing. When you're moving your body, that's just different. Um, you know, you're, you're emotional. Um, you've got different juices running through your brain and your body. And everything's more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, random tangent. Uh, was a Spyro remaster ever a consideration prior to Reignited Trilogy? No, um, we didn't know remasters were a thing. <laughs> Fair enough. And it turned out they're a thing, and then Sp Spyro made perfect sense. So I think the simple answer is no. Fair enough. Um, do you have a favorite Skylander? Oh, it changes all the time. I was just going through them with this, this eight-year-old kid, and um, Eyebrawl was the one that yeah. I was really loving the most. And the kid's like, why? Why do you like it? And I'm like, because his eye comes off and you can fly around with his eye, but your body keeps punching. <laughs> so he eventually saw the wisdom in that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, uh, I, I mean, obviously got to love Sparrow, but I, uh, I'm Aww. partial to Cinder. Um, I, just, oh, cool. I just think Cinder is a cooler Spyro. <laughs> <laughs> like if you like if you play Legend of Spyro Dawn of the Dragon, it's like, oh cool, you can play a Spyro and that's great, but you can also play a Cinder and she has poison breath and she looks yeah. more badass and yeah, I'm gonna play a Cinder. So I'm not playing Spyro, yeah. <laughs> I've got the option. Yeah, Spyro's he's got a good personality. He's like he the congeniality award. Mm. No, he's it's you know, with Spyro he does have all that personality and he's he's the kind of meter that everything is judged by so as you create new characters they have to be yeah. different but cool in their own way and yeah they do end up sort of stealing the show i mean in, in skyland it's cinder uh breathes electricity and i do like electricity so just like okay. you know I, this cool. wind like ticks it. all the ticks all the boxes it's great you gotta get an electric car if you don't have one i i don't even drive so oh, okay never mind I, I live on a tiny island. I can just get a bus if I need, or I walk. Like, it's, it's. Uh, no, are you in Jersey? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, like um, it's, a, it's a nine by five mile island. It's very small. My daughter uh, went to school in Edinburgh. Kind of left Northern California for Edinburgh, and and pretty much never came back. And she's been mm. living in London ever since. Um, and um, she had a friend who, out of uni, went. Uh, I think to Guernsey and then oh, Jersey. Yeah, Guernsey's tiny. There was a, there was a like murder on the island. He was he was so lucky. There was a murder on the island, which was the first big news in a million years. Um, and so uh, I remember talking with him about that. And he was sort of the voice of Jersey or the voice of Guernsey for the BBC for a while. Mm. Then then he got to go back to London. 
Yeah, there's, there's there's not too much news stories that come out of Guernsey or Jersey, but but when there is, it's 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 big. <laughs> it's dark and it's big. <laughs> that's good. Otherwise, like, oh, a seagull stole my lunch. Oh, well, that's news. <laughs> that happened to me here in Brighton, walking along, and my wife at the time has this delicious like ice cream cone, and there's just this like. I don't know how to describe it, but continuity break to reality as seagull wings are in all of our faces. <laughs> and then we see the seagull flying off with an ice cream cone, not spilling the ice cream miraculously. And and we were all so flustered. And our Yeah, it freaks friend, you out. She, it's just like, oh, the, the savage. What is you why would you <laughs> Savage is the right word. Yeah, so rude. They're they're evil. They're they're not as terrifying as geese, but they're up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I have a complicated relationship with geese, but I do. <laughs> have you do played love. Untitled Goose Game? Because you would probably love it. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. As I, my daughter um, from London sent me screenshots of her pe- playing it, and it's great. She, um, her alter ego for a long time has been the Gossip Goose. For, <laughs> so geese have been in our family mythology for quite a while, and uh, I, yeah. I, I had relationships with them as a kid, so they're they're a perfect character. Mm. My God, what a brilliant idea that is! So, uh, yeah, back to uh, Skylanders. Yeah. Um, which of the Skylanders games is your favorite? I know you have to pick one of your babies here, but <laughs> sure, it's either Giants or Imaginators. Um, I think probably Giants because it was such an intense experience. Um, you know, we all were working just like crazy and we got to do, I would say giants. Um, and in part, I'm thinking about not just the game, but the experience of developing it was so fun. I think in terms of the game that I'm proudest of that we did, it was Imaginators. Um, uh, just, uh, <laughs> there's parts I think that I'm very proud of that not many people got to experience. So the 3d printing your own Skylander toy yeah, was such so cool. It was pretty cool. Not everybody got to do it, and um, but also I just thought that we. I, I thought the idea of making your own Skylander was sort of a great way for us to um, pause our, you know, releasing Skylanders games, yeah. uh, at least for the console. You know, sort of say, okay, you know, while we're off doing other things, you guys make some great Skylanders, and um, so I, I, that's what I would say. Uh, but there's things I love about all of them. Can't remember which game is my favorite Sky Stones. It might be Trap Team, um, and the narrative. Uh, I mean, I lo- Alex Ness's narrative work is just amazing, um, in my mind. So he's the guy who wrote virtually all the dialogue for our games. Yes, maybe for the last one. But um, there's just some really funny, quirky stuff in there that I love. Uh, so I'm proud. Of, I'm proud of uh, the, the storytelling that Alex did, and you know our first first games. What would you say is the biggest change to how something ended up in the final version of uh, Spire's Adventure? Um, it was probably one of the. Ori- I mean, we had an original character that was the um, electric squid, the electric octopus, and um, he was this big eyeball with uh, kind of like a. I guess he was more like a mollusk with a giant eyeball that shot lightning out of his eyeball. And he would, you know, sort of sklunk around on the ground, leaving this slimy trail, and then um, could zap people. And by the time we were done, we had the dragon zap, who, while bearing some of the powers, was just so much more appealing and fun. So that was a huge change. I'm trying to think of, and so as a character, that was one of the big changes. And the same thing with Vu, uh, with um, Double Trouble. Uh, um, he he ended up he started off uh, entirely differently um, as an old man wizard. Uh, Interesting. But in terms of, yeah, he was he was just this old gray bearded classic wizard. Um, I mean, who left behind like little garden gnome guys, and we just discovered that that wasn't appealing to kids uh, uh, an old dude with a white beard just didn't didn't compare with our other skylanders so we changed him at the last minute um in terms of game mechanics 
it's hard to say. There's game mechanics that we ended up not doing. Um, you know, we talked for a while about doing a feature where you could send all of send your Skylanders off on away missions, and that had. Did, have you ever played Fallout Shelter? Uh, no, I've not played it. But I've seen uh, gameplay. Well, there's sort of appointment based gameplay where you send a character or or some agent of yours for real Earth time off for hours or days and then they come back and give you a reward or have have some sort of adventure that you read about and we were thinking well people have so many skylanders now kind of late in the game what if we gave them this sort of way that they could use those toys by sending the skylanders off for days at a time and then they could bring stuff back and that way your toy collection would matter you couldn't use that toy while it was off on its away mission uh but but you could sort of take advantage of the scale of your collection to do these things because some of the missions would require combinations of many Skylanders to even start. And I thought that was a really cool idea. It's just it didn't dovetail with the rest of the game, the the, the pacing, and the, it just wasn't fun in that context. Right. But um, that's a feature that I always wanted to have. I think it probably like could have been an interesting like post game sort of mode maybe somewhere. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, I'd love to see it. <laughs> Big question. We say the weirdest thing that happened during development. Mm, Fred, what was the weirdest thing that happened during development? Of, of any of the Skylanders? Yeah. yeah. Things are just kind of weird here as a general rule. Um, let me see. There are some very poignant things, but those weren't necessarily weird. Um, wow, that's what I may have to put some thought into. Um, I mean, sometimes the weirdest things are when you end up getting in like a verbal argument verging on fight with someone over an issue, and then you take a step back and realize we're talking about a power where the character is squirting stuff out of his eyeball, and we're almost getting in a fight about this. <laughs> this is like a 21st century problem where two adult, you know, um, in this case, men who are college educated and, you know, just have been careers for years and years are so passionate about what they do that they're yelling at each other and we're worried about blows exchanged over the exact manner in which juice squirts out of an eye. Because <laughs> in the moment, it's totally serious. Yeah. And spoiler alert, I'm one of the two guys. <laughs> I think the correct answer is water bottle with like just squeeze that amount yeah, huge i like that exactly yeah can't be can't just be a dribble that would be <laughs> it's vitreous fun. Humor as well as human. no no um but anyway so that's that's my story so uh you've moved on uh from toys above you said you're still in the offices uh right just like consulting here and there yeah i mean we're 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 working on a project um it's unannounced and mm. probably won't be for, for quite a while. Fair enough. But the, the great thing is that Fred and I get to be intimately, creatively productive on it. You know, there's very little overhead in terms of management right now. And, um, you know, we've sort of got the uh, freedom to explore a lot of wild, I can, in, in some cases, crazier than Skylanders ideas. So um, we're... That's that's what we're doing right now, and uh, you'll you'll hear from us, but you know, but it's not this year. That's fine. Uh, maybe not next year. That's awesome. Uh, I guess finally, uh, what advice do you have for anyone looking to get into the gaming industry? Talk with people in the gaming industry. Talent and training matter a lot, but finding personal connections with people and not in a gross manipulative way, but just it's an industry in which a lot of personal friendship and passion matters. And so I'd say, and, and it's also kind of wonky. It's not for everybody. So I do whatever you can to spend a little time in a studio or in a development process. So potentially um, try working in some related part of the company. And if you can't get a job as an artist or a designer, maybe take a job in production or even in quality assurance and testing just to see what it's like and to meet people. Um, and the other thing I'd say is work on games that you're passionate about and that the other people are passionate about. 
There's games that earn a lot of money and pay a lot of money to people who work on them, <coughs> and that's fine. And you know, we all need to earn livings. But um, if you're getting into it, start with a game that you care about. That's what I'd say. That's great. Thank you very much uh, for agreeing to do this. It's it's been a wonderful uh, experience talking to you in depth about this. Because, like, oh, as, sure. as I said, like I, I I love Skylanders and I love the gaming industry, and I feel like not enough people truly understand. And myself, to a, to a degree, to understand what what happens within the gaming industry, and 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 no one realizes just how wonderful it is. And and like I've met many people at Toys for Bob, and it's you're, you're all lovely people, and it's just it's <laughs> it's great to uh, to you know share that. Um, oh, thank you, yeah. thank you, and you know, I, I, Fred and I, Fred and I can take some credit for what Toys for Bob was, Paul and Avery. Uh, and actually all the new folks at Toys for Bob for the past couple of years, they, they have really taken our idea and run with it. And I'm just so proud of what they've done. And that is that. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around. I also have a Twitch, a Twitter, and a Patreon if you'd like to support me and the channel. This is just the first episode of a big series that's going to last all month, and we're going to talk about a lot of stuff to do with the game, the franchise, and the industry, and it's going to be really cool. And of course, we'll dive into Spyro Reigniter Trilogy a little bit, because a lot of these people worked on that game as well. So... Yeah, thank you very much for watching. I truly hope you enjoyed this. This has been a thing in the works for quite some time, and it's been a huge passion project of mine, and yeah, it uh, means a lot for you checking it out and you've stuck with it this far. So hopefully I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>